Garrett's. And I'm Marcy Keithley, and I'll be with you this evening along with Jennifer, well, maybe Jennifer, part of the evening, and uh, Beth Sturry is going to help out uh, in the Zoom room. At this time, if you haven't already, please place yourselves on mute. And we'd like to remind you that tonight's presentation will be recorded. Um, please remain, again, please remain muted. Raise your hand if you have a question or you would wish to be recognized. Uh, also feel free to post your comments and questions in the chat bar. Okay, again, a little bit about us. Of course, all the, the conversation right now is about conference in September. Uh, the 9th, 10th, and the 11th. And if you want inf more information, you can go to our website or feel free to reach out to myself, Jennifer, or anyone on the board. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I would like to introduce April. And let's learn a little bit about April. Okay, let's see. April Dinwoody, uh, after a successful career in corporate marketing, branding, and PR, in a lifetime as a black, biracial, transracially adopted person, April is devoted to elevating our shared experiences of humanity and identity to build stronger relationships. Her podcast, Born in June, Raised in April, What Adoption Can Teach the World, helps facilitate an open dialogue about identity, family, and differences of race, class, and culture. April is the former CE of the Donaldson Institute and the founder of Adoptment a mentoring program that matches foster youth with adopted adults. Today, April is a consultant and facilitator for systems and corporations, a coach for individuals and groups, and a keynote speaker. So let's welcome Ep April, everyone. Hello, happy Friday. Woohoo. Yeah, thank you, Marcy, and um, all the folks at NAAP for welcoming me, making space, and for doing this. Uh, I am honored. I'm happy to see so many people here that I know, some that I don't know. Welcome. Thank you for letting me know where you are. And thank you for some that are sharing their, uh, your connection to adoption. I'm grateful to know and uh, always a joy to be holding space particularly when we come together as this extended family of adoption, uh, particularly when we do so in, you know, in a way that no one ever expected or intended us to, uh, as different experiences um, that were separated. And now, because we can, we are all together in community and conversation. And I find that empowering. I find that amazing. I find that um, healing. Uh, I find it fun um, and I'm grateful. So I do also just want to just hold a little bit of space because as Marcy put in the chat, I too was like, wait, DNA, dogs, what? Whoa, you know, it, I started to get that little like feeling um, and I, I I welcome, I welcome talking about that. I, I'm so happy, right, that we can kind of put things out there. That's the truth. Like that is love, that is empathy and compassion. And it's all the things that we uh, are here to bring to this conversation, or at least that's what I intend to bring. Uh, so let's, let's hope that we can do that together. So um, I thought what I would do is share a little bit about um, how I am working with uh, parents and professionals today. And I think when I share what I'll share, it, it's also a holding place for those of us who share in the experience of being adopted persons. Uh, one of the things that I recognize is that for me doing this work, which if you had told me, you know, at the beginning of my marketing and communications career that I would be doing this for a living, I would have said, are you kidding me? What, what are you talking about? Uh, so I never expected that I would be doing this, but doing this work, um, and I'll explain a little bit exactly what I do these days. Um, it heals the little April, honestly, it really does. It is so amazing to see professionals and parents coming to any type of environment, whether that's now Zoom these days or in person, 
wanting to hear from me and, and actually wanting to hear from me, knowing how I talk and what I talk about. <laughs> like any parent or professional who wants to come and spend time with me, I'm like, I'm here for it because um, I, I, I bring some realness and um, I'll share with you how I, how I do that too. So I'll, I'll share my screen, I'll share some slides and then we'll talk. Um, so don't hesitate though, if you wanna investigate something further that I've talked about, we are keeping an eye on the chat. And since for so many of us, um, our power and control has been taken away in a lot of ways, not just from the beginnings of our lives in some ways, but also throughout this last year in the pandemic, I'd like to give grace and sort of some power and control back to any groups that I'm working with. So if we wanna go steer into something, let's do it. Um, we're a small enough group where we should be able to do that effectively. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, go ahead and share my screen and kind of jump in. And, and again, this is really um, for me, um, a way for, uh, uh, me to kind of tell you a little bit about me, but then also really to give you a window into how I approach the training and uh, coaching uh, work that I do. So I, I, I just thought it would be kind of a useful thing for anyone who is experiencing uh, the, the, anybody in the extended family of adoption who is experiencing adoption from whatever place that they are experiencing it. So here we go. So first and foremost, you know, a lot of the work that I do now these days dips into, um, you know, this kind of interesting space of, um, you know, are we, uh, hold on a second. I can't see folks. I don't like this. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me try this again. I want to be able to see people too. I think I know what I have to do. Hold on. At least a few people I want to see. You know, I mean, as many people as I can. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, most of these most of these conversations um, are coming at this intersection of, you know, talking about adoption and family structure and identity, but they're also about differences of race, class, and culture and diversity. So, I like to set some some norms and some values as we come into conversation together. And I, I, I tend to do this and then like, if something else needs to be added, we add it. But I just wanna create the, the spirit by which I come into a room and then everybody else can kind of hold these things as they hold them. And it's really quick and easy. I do this like uh, kind of like the foundational stuff. I call them the ABCCs. Uh, actively listen um, as much as you talk, uh, avoid assumptions and seek true clarity. If something I say isn't kind of adding up, making sense, like investigate that and certainly ask me. Um, be present, stay checked in and commit to the practice of being, uh, being effective in complicated conversations. Um, commit to the community, be aware of how others are experiencing the space. We just had a little bit of a feeling right there, right then. What I loved about it is we felt safe to be able to talk about what was coming up for us, right? So if someone in this in this moment in time, if you know someone on this, on this uh, Zoom right now, and you think that they may need a check-in, or if, hey, if you need a check-in, feel free to, you know, like, utilize this community for what it's here for, right? This, 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 this kind of solidarity, this healing, this holding space, but be aware how you are experiencing the space and how others might be experiencing the space. Harder to do on Zoom, but not impossible. And then the last is confidentiality. Um, I offer myself very openly and very vulnerably. You can repeat anything I say, right? Um, I may deny it, but you can repeat it. Um, no, I'm not I'm kidding. I, I won't deny it. But I, I would um, just um, have folks resist the urge. If someone does a personal share, just resist the urge to play that back um, with attached, you know, an attachment to a name before you ask that other person, hey, I heard you on the Zoom. Is it okay if I share this? Um, with, you know, I think someone might help be helped by hearing your narrative may share it with attached to you or not. You can always play back a story narrative or something that you heard without giving too many details about an individual person. I hold these kinds of spaces very sacred uh, in terms of confidentiality. So um, we're all here together. We didn't sign a waiver or media, but that's cool. But I just wanted to bring that to the table just as a, as a starting place. Um, you know, because um, in this, you know, we have to put Simone Biles into the mix right now because she just, again, uh, became the most decorated gymnast and she is adopted, um, kinship adoption. Um, because we know adoption and foster care and differences of race, culture, and class are Olympic sized moves of the highest degree of difficulty. And for the longest time that I can remember, and even today, we're supposed to make it look easy. We're supposed to twist and turn in the air, and everybody's just supposed to go in the water clean, right? There's nothing to see here. It's all good. Everybody, you know, everybody's where they're supposed to be, right? Um, but, but 
in the Olympics, you know, to, to be able to operate at this high level and to be able to do the things even transactionally like diving and, and, and gymnastics, what do you have? You have trainers, you have coaches, someone tells you when to eat, when to sleep. There's someone instructing you and guiding you along a very complicated and really rigorous journey. Um, so I, I, I make that comparison because I think in a lot of ways, adoption, foster care, differences of race, culture, and class, family structure, and identity are like Olympic size and Olympic degrees of difficulty of, of relationship and identity work. And, and so often we don't always have the coaches. We don't always have um, the people that are supporting us and doing that very high degree of, of relational work. So I, I like to sort of start, uh, I like to sort of start there and uh, frame, frame things. And then I sort of go into the five principles that I, I've held for a very long time um, in, in you know, this idea that adoption is not a one-time transaction. We know it's a lifelong journey. Um, I believe in the basic human rights for all human beings, especially those connected to adoption and foster care and family structure. I can't think of anything more human than being born. And I can't think of anything more profound than not staying with your family of origin and moving into a new family of experience. And I think everybody within this extended family has rights. And when we don't, when we violate those rights, we put, most importantly, we put children at risk. So when I think about human rights, I think about narrative being removed from a child's life. I, I think about not being uh, given options to parent your child in uh, in in the world of the you know the industry of adoption, and I think about adoptive parents who are not given information and not given um, the support that they need in order to parent in this way. Um, the next one is children are not commodities. Um, we know that there is an industry of adoption. Um, the Baby Brokers is this new article in Time Magazine by Tick Root, who happens to be a transracially adopted person. Um, that article um, is is telling us what we've all long known and what we've also you know, had reports of, um, but it's great to see it on the pages of Time Magazine and hopefully um, people will be, be curious and, and look closer in. Um, I did think that article was still very white centered and very parent centered. Uh, so I do, I do recommend reading it, but for me, it, it, it sort of missed the mark in terms of like, adding the complexity, even one line of the complexity about caring for the, for the child that was very parent centric. And then uh, also that all of these things get even more complicated when there is a difference of race and culture. So uh, children are not commodities. That's a, that's a big one, right? We need to really understand where the money goes and why um, adoption in America lacks uniformity. Um, we know this, right? And in these differences of laws, policies and practice around the country make it harder for parents uh, and professionals to do what is right for children. Um, when we have a patchwork of laws, it makes it somewhat chaotic and confusing to know what is, um, what is expected, what is the right way for things to be moving. And when we're all moving, um, especially parents that may be in a crisis moment and uh, parents who may be in an urgency to parent, um, we're moving with that as a base. And then there's confusion around policy. Um, what do we do with that, right? Um, and the last is there'll be no reform without education. And that's not just academic education. It's education like this where we come together and we talk and we share and we do things um, in conversation that um, help us understand and help us learn and grow. So this is really about a broadly spoken of education that helps us learn and grow. Just a few more things. Um, I settle on three big uh, sort of buckets, if you will. And I start them in this way and I move through them in this order. Uh, I help people understand the importance of developing healthy identity. Um, everybody within the extended family, the parents, the, the children, the um, aunties and uncles and folks connected to this experience and, and how important it is to be solid in your identity. Next is how to build stronger relationships and not just to people and human beings, but to complicated things. We can't have a relationship to human beings without, especially within this extended family of adoption, without having relationships to complexity. What was your relationship like to adoption before you had adoption as an experience? What was your relationship to differences of race, culture, and class before you had a, a, a difference of race, culture, and class within your family experience? Only then can we move through to relationships with human beings uh, that are centered on complexity. Only then can we move through those experiences with, with um, you know, with 
nothing is with ease when it comes to relationships, but I do feel like um, it's, 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 it's much easier to move through the human relationship when you've had the relationship to the things that are hard. And then the last is we do all that stuff and then we can do the hard stuff, which is facing and embracing differences of race, culture, and class. So it's like really one, two, three, and, and they're all mixed up really, but I like to do that work in that order. So I really try to help parents and professionals understand who they are, why it's important to build healthy relationships. And then, then with those two things really grounded and secure, then you can go into the hard stuff. And you know, sometimes life doesn't wait for that, um, but that's the way kind of we roll. And then a few guiding principles. The first is even the most vigilant eyes have blind spots. You could be doing all the work. You could be reading all the books. You could be in it. You could be uh, just really doing everything you, you could possibly do. And you still could have some blind spots, right? I hope to fill in some of those gaps in the blind spots. Um, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 Hours Theory. I love that book, Outliers. And he speaks of, it takes 10,000 hours to get expert at something. Shooting hoops, knitting, doing handstands, whatever it is, takes 10,000 hours of practice. I'm always asking parents and professionals, how many hours of practice do you have, really have at navigating complexity around adoption and foster care, being in, in relationship, looking at identity, really being, steering into the hard parts, not just transactionally working through to get things done in check boxes, like how many hours do you really have? Uh, and then the last is that all parents and families are my parents and families. So look, I'm transracially adopted. I have nice white parents, I love them. Uh, and I say a lot of stuff about our relationship and how they parented me that isn't always easy to hear. It isn't always easy to say, uh, but I love them and I respect them. And when I say things to parents who aren't my parents, but are parenting kids through adoption, I, I want to hold them just like I would hold my parents because I think it's right to do that. And I, 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 I want to, I want people to grow and learn and be held. And I, and I, I know just my own personal life experiences, I can only do that when I feel safe and when I feel cared for in a way. So I always try to build that into what I do. Now, I also keep it tight and I also don't mind, you know, keeping it sharp <laughs> because that's important. But at the end of the day, this is really important to me. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there really quickly um, and uh, see if anybody's got any reactions to this or thoughts or questions, um, anything in the chat that I should know about. And then um, if there's not, I'll move into a, a little bit more about me and then a few things that I've learned uh, during the pandemic. Does anyone have a question for April? You wanna take themselves off mute? Right now, no? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Cool, thanks. Uh, here we go, back in it. All right, we talked about Malcolm Gladwell. Love it. Okay, so these are my parents. Speak of the devil, right? These are my parents, Tom and Sandy. Um, high school sweethearts, went to 4-H together. Everybody know what 4-H is? If you don't, it's a, it's horticulture health, something, something. I always get it messed up, but it's something you do when you're a kid and it's outdoors, nature, it's very New England, right? And Midwest um, and maybe other parts of the country too. I shouldn't be so like geographically not smart about that, but I, I know from where it works in my part of the universe, which is Rhode Island. So they met there, little kids, went to high school together, high school sweethearts, all the things. And uh, my mom says, if um, my mom told her friends in her junior year of high school, if we show up at the junior prom, that means we're engaged because I'm not going to the prom unless we get engaged. Hmm. So when they showed up at the prom, everybody knew that they were engaged. So, you know, this is, uh, this is, my parents and uh, as they, as, as every sort of young couple was doing at the time in the, in the sixties, late sixties, they were uh, starting to have a family. But for, for um, my parents, it took them a long time. And I think something happened with my parents that I don't really talk to them a lot about, but it, it really does resonate with me because when I was talking about the early married life with them, you could tell even, you know, 50 plus years later, that it, that they were holding so much emotion around not being able to get pregnant right away. And something happened to their community because they didn't have children and their other friends who were also getting married and having children, starting families, they started to do things as a community without them because they didn't have kids. So they were being left out of certain things. They were, they were not invited to the things where there were children because they were a couple and without children. And 
I started thinking about this and I don't really like even thinking about it because I love my parents. I never want them to have any pain, especially any pain that I could, um, you know, even be sort of somewhat attached to, um, certainly had nothing to do with me. I wasn't even thought of yet, but, um, I heard the pain in their voices and the pain was about not being able to have kids, but the pain was also about being excluded and othered by their friend group. And I thought, you know what, um, as I was on this quest to always understand their experiences, so maybe they could understand mine. That's the closest they will get to ever feeling othered and ever feeling like what it might feel a tiny little bit, a tiny bit like to be a person of color and different. Um, and it's not the same thing by any means, but it's a place where they had pain around something that they had no control over. And it was separating them from other people. It was making them feel badly. It was something that they couldn't control. So, you know, um, as always trying to connect the dots, not to exploit pain, but trying to connect the dots. I really thought about this time in their life as a time where two white privileged people from Rhode Island who wouldn't really ever kind of have a simulation for what it feels like to be a different race and, and be different than other people, this is as close as it's gonna get for them. And again, it's a, a bridge very far, but just something that I was thinking about. And it does resonate sometimes with parents when I speak about this, of just trying to find space in their experiences where they can get even closer to the child that they're parenting that may be a different race from them. So of course, um, as the doctors all told them, um, about four years into their marriage, they got pregnant with my oldest brother. If you ask them the happiest day of their life, it's not when my brother was born, it's when they found out that they were pregnant with him for reals, right? So it was just the idea of a baby actually. So that speaks to a lot of our, um, our experiences as well, right? Like uh, so many parents, just anticipation. Um, and that's not every parent's experience, but it was my parents' experience. And of course, because they couldn't get pregnant, you know, for so long, 11 months later along came my brother, Jim. And then three years later came my sister, Dawn. And in their family planning and then their way in which they thought they would like to see their family designed um, before you could sort of dial up with, um, you know, a probably very expensive um, fertility doctor but before that existed, um, when you could literally implant a female embryo and, and almost guarantee a pregnancy, not always guarantee um, a baby, but guarantee a pregnancy with a girl um, that wasn't in existence yet. So the way that you you, you got a girl um, was to adopt one. Um, and that yes, they wanted to parent, but yes, they, they were very much um, in that gender selection space where that's the way you got a girl, right? Uh, so they wanted to parent and they wanted two boys and two girls. My sister was begging for a sister and boop, there she is. Um, they said they could parent any child, they could love any child, uh, didn't matter the race, they would take a medically fragile kid, um, they didn't see color. So there she is, uh, about eight months old, uh, uh, foster to adopt placement after a short stint in foster care, temporary foster care, after a very short stay in the hospital with my mother of origin, Helen June. So obviously before I was in a foster to adopt placement. I was in a foster, temporary foster placement. And before all that happens, I have to be born, right? Because that's where it all starts. Uh, and I was born to Helen June. Um, she was a parent to three already, a single parent, had been married, divorced, and was parenting three children, twin girls and a boy, um, and then became pregnant with me. From the best I can piece together, based on the very few um, two conversations we had, um, and a couple of letters back and forth, uh, there was an act of sexual, uh, criminal violence. Um, and that has, that is how I was conceived. And I believe that must've gone into her thought process, although we did not talk about that. The, the knowing of that through a letter from her really was the end of our communication and connection. Um, she was not, able to welcome that the family that she was born into did not know of me, neither did the children that she raised. Um, and there was another child after me, she married again and had another child after me. So she parented four children 
relinquished one me. And um, I don't know that much about her other than through story. And there's a few things that have come up that are really cool about her, like um, how ahead of her time she was, how um, she flooded the backyard one year in, a, in, a, in the, winter, the dead of winter and made an ice rink for the neighborhoods. They never had a lot of money. And um, she always found clever ways to make fun things happen. Um, so I've learned a little bit about her through some family of origin that I am connected to now. Um, but Helen had a mother, June Bug, they called her June Bug, her name was June, her name, Helen June, then um, that's my half sister, Debbie, one of the twins, and then her daughter, June. So you see the theme here, um, June all, all the way around almost, right? And so my name at birth, my name of origin was uh, June Elizabeth. And when my parents found out that they were getting a girl, uh, the girl that they so desired, they decided on the name April Elizabeth. And they did not know that I was already June until they signed the papers in the, in the um, court. And they were like, wow, you just changed her by a month. And of course I'm born in, anybody wanna guess? I may, some may know, don't say if you know. Um, who, thinks, uh, who thinks June? Who thinks June? Okay, who thinks April? Uh, who thinks neither, neither? April is born, June and April is born in October, y'all, because that makes all the sense in the world, right? Okay, so make it make sense. June is what, the sixth month? April is what the fourth month and October is what the 10th month. So four plus six equals 10. So it actually does add up. Just saying, um, I love it. Cause you know what? It, it doesn't make sense until it makes sense. And I'm like, I'm gonna make it make sense in that way from today. <laughs> so I am born in October and I'll tell you what, um, the whole name game thing for me um, and being having them be different months. So like everything I do, and this is why the podcast is called Born in June, Raised in April. Um, because I have these two names and it's weird and ironic. And also there's some synchronicity in it, right? There's like, like there is an adoption. We could all talk about the synchronicity that has happened in our lives in different ways. And guess what? If it hasn't happened in your life yet and you're attached to adoption, wait for it. It's going gonna, it gonna to happen. <laughs> synchronicity is like a thing. Um, the universe is real. So born in June, raised in April, there's irony in it. And, and, you know, for the longest time and still am, you know, just try to make sense of something complicated, right? And I was like, damn, how do you make sense of something so complicated? And it dawned on me one day, I was like, the calendar, the calendar, the calendar, the calendar is a thing that everybody sort of has to deal with it, unless you're off the grid. And if you're off the grid, I don't know you and you're not part of society. So mm, like, whether we like the calendar or don't like the calendar, more meetings, bing pings when you got a meeting to come up, whether you disdain it, love it, somewhere in between, like a calendar connects us. We all, we all know it's Friday, you know? I, I, let's hope we know it's Friday because if we, we don't know it's Friday. Actually, if you don't know it's Friday, maybe that's a good thing too, <laughs> I don't know. But like, we know the day, most days we know. Um, so I thought, you know, like the calendar could really be a thing that could help us. It can break down things, you know, one month at a time. So I use it really like almost always in my work and my training and my podcast, it's like, let it, let it, let, let, let this thing, let's, let's use this thing, right? We can celebrate, we can commemorate the both and. You know, one of the tricks I tell parents to do is if you know parents of origins, birthdays, put them on the calendar, celebrate them. Say without them, there's no you. We're gonna light a candle, we're gonna sit for a moment, we're gonna have a cupcake and then we're gonna keep it moving. Better yet, call parents of origin and wish them a happy birthday or send them a note. Like without them, there's no kid, right? So we have to honor that. And if you don't know, people say, oh, we don't know when the birthday is. Okay, well, maybe you could find out, right? Um, but together as a family, not to make up untruths, but pick a day when you wanna honor them. Say, we're gonna honor, honor your parents of origin today we're, because without them, there's no you. So there's a way to hold this calendar and, and, and prepare ourselves, right? You can break down the complexities one month at a time. And then when we have these guiding, pieces and parts of the calendar, they can help create opportunities that one month at a time, we can engage like at least once per month, you can have a guiding question about adoption. And, and sometimes the, the calendar gives us these things like right now we're in, we're in the middle of, you know, in between this place of June and April, right? Um, or excuse me, of May and June, Mother's Day, Father's Day, 
get ready, right? Because those days can hit us as uh, members of the extended family of adoption. And, and whether we want to not see it or hear it, it's like go into any, any, any pharmacy, any, any store, go online. It's Mother's Day, it's Father's Day, yay. And now we may wanna celebrate that, but we also may not wanna celebrate that. We may have complicated feelings about that, that day. And so what does it look like to help prepare professionals and parents to kind of see some of these com things coming, to care for themselves, but then also make space to care for a child that may be thinking, oh gosh, like me, oh, um, should I be thinking about my birth mom today? I don't know. Like, I want to make this for my mom, but I, do I have another mom? As a kid, like this stuff was like right here. And there were times where I just acted out because I was like, are you my real mother or not? Because I, I want to know what's up with this. So we can prepare for some of these things. It doesn't take away the complexity or the pain that can come with it. But it, if we're prepared for it, it's like, it can be better to navigate, easier to navigate. So each month has a theme and I kind of take people through that. Um, and it helps me, I mean, like, it helps me kind of organize myself. I think like, okay, what am I gonna need? You know, how am I gonna navigate this birthday? What, how, do, how do I want to ask for help around my birthday? So a little bit more about my family. Um, these are, these are um, my, uh, this is members of my family of origin. Um, I call them my real family, right? Um, they're the first family I was connected to. Um, you know, I was reconnected to them as a as a grown up. So that's my real family, right? And I also call this my real family. This is the family that I uh, was raised with, right? Um, I have this real problem with language and adoption, especially real. Um, if the family that did not keep me is real, and the one that did is not, what does that make me? So I, I really really want us to think about holding that language, especially around real and deciding for ourselves what we wanna do with that, right? It's, it's not not gonna happen. You're gonna be out in the world. So it's like, do you know your real family? I mean, we know as grownups, like I'm like, okay. And I've been kids that I work with. It's like, this comes up all the time, but we can choose to maybe guide, guide people and correct them. We can choose to go do something good for ourselves after when that word hits us. And we have to wrestle with, well, well, am I real? Like, is this real? Uh, so language, right? We could have a whole happy hour about language, uh, but that's just one I, I, I like to hold for a minute and um, make sure that, you know, whatever way that this, this comes to you, that you have a space in which to hold, um, hold it. So, um, you know, this is me and these are all the people around me. A lot of questions as a kid, where'd I come from? How'd I get here? Who are these people? And why are they all so white, right? This little brown person. Now I didn't have the way in which to create language around my experiences at this age, but over time, that is what happened. So that's why I do what I do, right? So that the little Aprils of the world don't have to navigate this journey of self and identity solo, because that's exactly what happened. Um, and I almost feel like I'm creating, you know, what I didn't have so that, again, everyone in the extended family of adoption can have a healthier holding of this experience, but most importantly, the adopted person. So talk about identity, right? Um, what's ironic about what we do in adoption, right? And um, how, we, how we hold it. Um, this is just something I, I shared on social media. For years, we as adopted persons uh, have been expecting adopted persons to do some of the deepest, most profound identity work with next to no guidance and sometimes without so much as an acknowledgement of the complexity of this huge and essential human labor. So we're asking, you know, children to move from one family to another to, in, in some cases, you know, remove their language of origin, remove their cultures of origin, um, remove their names that they were given. and and to do this like deeply human, profoundly human work. And sometimes people don't even recognize it's happening. I'm like, we're getting so much more clear on, on this work, uh, uh, more broadly on identity work, right? 23 and Me and Ancestry wouldn't be so popular if we weren't interested in who we are, where we come from, what's the narrative, what's the story, who am I connected to? Um, exploring identity, even through names we put up on social media accounts, like changing names, changing our genders. Like we are in this really unique and, and, and really open in a lot of ways, conversation and, and 
and, and movement around identity. But we've been doing this identity work and adoption for a very long time. And it's not like just a pastime or interesting. It's it's part of our grounding in our humanity. It just seems that there's there's more interest in it these days. But I just I love this because what where the work uh, shifts for me and I help shift it is to the grownups, the professionals and the parents that aren't doing their identity work, right? If the parents and professionals aren't doing their identity work, they're not going to be able to help children do theirs. So we really need to level up as like professional organizations and individuals who are parenting to like do the identity work so that that you can help children and young people do theirs. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a way to do it. Um, and also, I love this um, Dr. McGuire, D Joyce McGuire Paper, who's my, um, my my idol and one of my mentors, one of my dear friends, um, was on my podcast, and she was talking about you know kind of her journey of identity and and asking those questions about adoption, which she would ask, and um, her the the answer she would usually get is, "Could someone pass the broccoli, please?" Like CTS, right? Like change the subject, uh, and that's where some folks are, right? That's where some folks are in this. Um, this, this space and time surrounding um, talking about adoption. It goes back to that practice, those 10,000 hours. And I'm really encouraging parents today and professionals to like, like really be intentional about role plays. People say, well, well, well what do I say? Um, how do I explain this to them? I'm like, well, what do you, first of all, what do you know? Like, what do you know? Like what facts and information do you have? Ha have you held that? Have you talked through this information and felt the emotion of it and the weight of it. So that when you speak to a child, you have your ground. It doesn't mean you don't have to be emotional. It doesn't mean that you can't show emotion when discussing some of this, but do you have your kind of this base in which to draw from so that you don't have to say, you know, you know why parents were saying this, right? Is because they didn't want to go there. They didn't have the skill or the will, maybe a combination of both, right? To go there. Did they not love their kid? No, I'm sure they love their kid, right? But it's like, you have to be practiced in some of this work. So um, I think a tiny little bit more about my beginnings. And then I'm just gonna talk a little bit about a few things from um, the pandemic that have kind of been, been interesting learning tools that I have shared with a lot of professionals and parents um, turning on some lights that I don't think were turned on before. So when I was, um, thought of in terms of adoption. Like I said, my parents were operating in this very um, good intended, I think, place of we don't see color, we could love any child. Um, obviously, that didn't go so well, y'all, but we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But, um, you know, the agency who was transacting my adoption, um, this is paperwork that I got as a grown up. Um, and it just really speaks to this idea that no one really wanted to talk about differences of race. Like I was seen by a geneticist because I had a, um, a telling birthmark that would indicate that I was either Mediterranean or biracial. Um, but they, but they basically all were like, but, but that, but that maybe isn't true because, you know, her, her birth mother said that, um, you know, there was no racial differences and all the things. So, you know, what that did for my parents was it allowed them to, um, not have to deal. So when professionals signal to parents that all you really need to do is start talking about adoption, use the word in your everyday life, and you don't really have to talk about race, just love her. So they, they were like, cool, the professionals, people are in charge, so we just have to love her, it's all good. So that's what they did, they loved me. And they kept doing white things. They were listening to John Denver, I wanted Stevie Wonder. They were watching Hee Haw, I wanted Soul Train. They had Prell and Breck dating myself in the shower. I needed carefree curl emotions. You know, it wasn't that, that white things were bad things. It were just, those were things that, that I, I just needed something different. It was Judy Bloom on the bookshelves. What about Toni Morrison? You know, there was just no place for any type of, of, of culture for me and or no holding of even some of the daily transactional things like I needed to do. I was washing my hair every day with Preck and Brel, like my stringy haired white blonde sister. By the way, my sister's hair is curly like mine these days, but as kids, we had um, different hair and different needs, but we were all treated the same. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to, well, I'm going to actually skip some things and then, um, because, because it's really fun to go right to hair. Yeah. You got to see the hair stuff as a kid, right? Um, but the, the thing about hair was it was so much a part of my identity. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just bad hair days, it was bad hair years. And 
you know, it's one thing to show up in a school and be the only adopted kid and a handful, three, one of three black biracial kids. But it's another thing to show up and, and not feel like you, you look you look good. And that's how it was, right? So my dad started cutting my hair, as you can see in these pictures, did not go well. Uh, and people often thought I was a boy, right? I had hand-me-downs. We lived on a farm. I grew up on a farm. Um, I usually wore my brother's clothes and that, that top shirt with the collar. That's my brother's shirt, which I was obsessed with, by the way, and wore it for class pictures. I was like, I'm wearing the shirt. And I was a girl. I wanted to be a girl. Like I presented as a girl. Um, I didn't want to be a boy. So for people to think I was a boy and ask, oh, why is that little boy in a dress? It was like, on top of everything else, I have to sort of manage, you know, like looking different and um, not feeling like I was was beautiful, right? Um, my mom would ask people on the street, like, how do you do that with, 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 your, with her hair? And um, I, I kind of liked it. You know, I, 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 was, I was one of those kids who would, like a lot of kids would be like, mom, like you're embarrassing me, stop it. And, but really deep down, I was kind of into it because it meant she was showing some kind of trying, um, but it was never followed through. Like she didn't try the things. So um, it became, you know, kind of a, a, a thing um, until I learned how to do my hair. And the last thing is um, inappropriate hair touching. So there was a lot of it. And I will just say that to me, I, I take hair touching very, very seriously because I think it's like a gateway to other inappropriate invasions of space for black and brown kids. And I think a lot of people think it's cute. Um, it's not cute. It's actually very unsafe. You don't like take going back to the dog moment for a second. There are you know, there's like protocols and like norms around dogs. You ask people if they can pet, you, know, you can pet their dog, you know, but, but all kinds of people have their hands in black and brown kids' hair. Wow, it's so fuzzy. And so even today, as a grown up, I have people like, oh my God, your hair's, can I touch it? You know, it's like, it's one thing to admire something. It's another thing to um, inappropriately invade someone's space. So I take this very seriously. And I, I really coach parents to get, get in on that. So this is one of the great books that I, I work with, through with parents called Don't Touch My Hair. Um, I love it. And it's, uh, it's a really good one. So I am going to, I'm going to stop there to see if anybody has any questions about um, growing up narrative. I mean, there's a lot more in there um, from, you know, how to love a transracially adopted person, how my, my racial identity impacted love and relationships. That's another happy hour with more tequila, by the way. Uh, but I just wanted to stop there before um, we kind of go into uh, you know, uh, into the pandemic a little bit and into things that, um, you know, might be resonating with folks. So I don't know, are there any questions in the chat or anything about my growing up years that you'd like to ask? Yeah, April, I got a question for you. Yeah. Long time fan, first time caller. Um, so I've heard you talk before about your parents saying, um, you know, they didn't see color. Uh, working as you do now um, with a lot of populations. What what do you say to parents who may reiterate something like that now? Um, well, I, I feel like there's such urgency around the psychological, physical, and emotional protection of black and brown persons and also other minorities, but I center on black and brown persons because I'm one of them. Doesn't mean that I don't I don't hold other minorities. I just that's the that's what I know best. Um, but I think it translates it's urgent. Like, it's like life, it's like, like your children's life depends on it now. Like you, you, you just, you, you can't, you can't be operating from that place. It's, it's so dangerous. It's, it's, it's just, it's just dangerous. So I, I really try to uh, also kind of bring it back to our sort of like our, our human operating systems, right? Like people see differences and, and it's okay. It's what we do and how we operate and move with those differences that matters, not that we see it or not. And when you say, I don't see it, to me, that's just lazy. And I think it's, people think it's well-intended. It's just, it, it's not, that's, it's, it's a lazy way to do things and it's lazy and dangerous. 
So I, I do bring it to that point and you can roll out all the statistics, right? That um, speak to, especially, especially with school age kids, right? Just look at the, you know, the disproportionality of, of in school and out of school suspensions. It's, it's almost always in every school just across the country overpopulated disproportionately black and brown kids that leave the, leave the classroom first or leave the school first. Um, when you look at over policing, I mean, the data and statistics are there. When we work in colorblind um, ways, it, it really just, it leaves, it leaves children completely vulnerable. It leaves vulnerable children even more vulnerable. So I, there's just no way, there's just no way to move like that and be doing a good job at parenting, um, in my opinion. And I, that's, you know, and, and, and I also bookend it with this, which is the, there's, a, there's a really, there's a really sort of intricate way in which it was somewhat okay that my parents operated that way, not okay, but that I survived it because I'm a light skinned woman. Had I been a dark skinned black boy in Westerly, Rhode Island during the seventies and eighties growing up and operating the way they did, it would not have been a pretty picture for me. It would, there were, I, I just know this town too well that I grew up in. And I know how the, the handful, the, the, there was one family of black boys in this town that was, that was in the, in, in the community that there were very, there were um, indigenous um, um, American Indian folks in our, in our, in our area too, but they were on reservation, right? They weren't in our community, but the, the two, the family that had two black boys, he, the father was on the police force. That's how they, those black boys got, were protected. Right, like so, it's very intricate, and I say that with with all knowing, with all the privilege that comes with my lighter skin, uh, and and that that's the only way I survived it was because I was a light skinned girl, and I and I say that very openly and honestly, and um, otherwise it just it wouldn't have worked uh, out. I mean, I it was still hard, but it would have been harder. Thanks for diving into this. You're doing great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, April, Tracy is um, asking about your bio, Dad. Do you have some more information regarding your, tell us a little bit more about Dad? Yeah, I wish I could tell you more. Um, you know, I, I told you that um, I heard um, from Helen, June, my mother of origin, um, in a letter. Like, I guess you could hardly call it a letter. It was sort of like a half piece of paper. Um, that's really hard to articulate, but I will, because I feel like this is family and I know I'm held here and I'm grateful for that. Um, I had I'd sent her a letter and, and, and some pictures and, you know, we had had one conversation on the phone and then, you know, I sent her a, a very carefully worded letter and carefully curated picture uh, stack. And uh, a while, a while later, I, I, got, I got a big envelope back and I thought, oh, maybe she's sending me pictures now. Like I was like, yeah. And then I opened the envelope and it was all my pictures back and everything I sent her back with a note because um, I had asked about my biological father and um, it literally, literally says this, this is it. it these are the words. Um, I don't know who your sperm donor was. I was raped. Hearing from you has made me very depressed. That's it. And everything sent back. So there, that was the point where I knew that, it, you know, I sent her a, a very carefully worded letter back um and trying to hold space for what that experience must have like been been like for her um and i stopped obviously asking and we stopped communicating and we didn't communicate again she passed um before i ever got to speak to her again uh but you know that that part that's a whole different part but you know there's just such a mystery around my father of origin and i have gotten some um hits on ancestry, some, some close in cousins that, that like always stops once there's a younger cousins and it always stops once we get to that next generation. Like, like when they start, when they, when they say, well, I'm going to talk to my mom or my dad, like no one ever calls me back. I'm like, okay. Like I, so something's there and I, I'm hopeful that I might find him, but you know, it's this really careful negotiation because, um, you know, I have spoken openly. I haven't, talked a lot about this, but I have written about the fact that that's how Helen told me about my conception. And I don't want anybody who's attached to me from family of origin on my birth father's side to feel like I'm gonna be coming from the place of trying to rectify that moment. Those were, that was with two grownups. I had nothing to do. I had really nothing to do with it. I just was the, you know, the outcome, but I have no interest in like rehashing what happened. It's not, it's not for me. 
but I do have an interest in knowing who my father of origin is, um, even with knowing that. And, and I, I, you know, people have said to me when they, and I don't tell a lot of people close in even, I mean, I talk about openly, it's ironic. I talk a lot about it openly in places like this, but I learned the hard way of speaking on this with close in people like family. They're like, well, you don't believe her, do you? That, that's probably not true. Right. And I'm like, Okay, so I don't know if you're trying to make me feel better, but if it's true, it's horrifying. And if it's not true, it might be worse. Like it might be worse that that it would be the narrative that was told to me and it wasn't true. So I hold that it's true. It's heartbreaking and hard, but I'm here and I'm good. Like I'm, I was supposed to be here. So however I got here, I, you know, I don't know how to make sense of it, but I'm here. Thank you, April. And I'm, I'm sorry about the passing of your mom. Thank you. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I know that's tender. Yeah, it is. It is. It um, is. Well, Lorene had a question. The chat bar is moving now, so hold on. I'm going to get back there. Uh, Lorene is asking, uh, did you watch This Is Us? How do you feel about the way Randall's story evolved? He finally found his voice and was able to tell his family that if they didn't see color, they didn't see him. Uh, I think this is us is really instructive. You know, I feel like it's um, whether, regardless of how you feel about it, and I'll tell you how I feel about it in a second. I think it's instructive. I think it's um, a way to start conversation, right? Because even if you don't have the same experience as any one of the characters in that uh, in that narrative. But we're, you know, we're speaking of adoption and transracial adoption, so that's what will hold that piece of it. Um, not everybody move, even transracially adopted person. Not everybody's like Randall. You know, there could be different ways in which we hold the experience and move. But it's jumping off place for conversation. So for that, I think this is us is is really helpful. And I and I do hope that people watch and and discuss and unpack and and say well, wow, like I didn't, I actually didn't see it this way. How do you see it, right? Or go do their work with, 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 with a facilitator, a mental health support person to get really grounded and centered and then bring it to your kid. I just, there's so much that you can do that's practical from that. Um, I wish there was a, 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 a more quick, um, deeper dive into mental health from the beginning. I feel like I wish that they had brought that to the surface sooner um, for Randall. Um, you saw sort of Kevin get mental health support straighter away. Like more, he, he went into mental health, but took a long time for Randall even just to get to a support group, right? So I just, I had sort of wished that we had seen that a little bit closer in. Um, but I'd like the show, look, I, you know, it gives, it's a good cry. Um, I think it's ridiculous though. Like, you know, people, you know, the, the, the problematic narratives in TV and even commercials are like, you know, you ask professionals, and like, this is us, people would be like, um, have, there, have there been any babies uh, left at fire stations? Can I have it? Um, or, you know, the paraplegic Olympian on the commercial for the Super Bowl, like all the agencies, phones ring off the hook the next day. Where can I get a paraplegic Olympic swimmer for a kid from Russia? Are they, do you have one for me? It's like, what? You know, so, um, that's, so that's the stuff that I think is problematic in TV and commercial and all the things, but I, I, I like the show. I'm not gonna lie. I think, I think it's, it's, worth, it's worth watching and talking about. Thank you. This is Lorraine, I'm chiming in, but you only see my picture up there. I'm not live on video, but thank you for answering that. I, I too found it very, um, I, as I watched the show, uh, when I started watching, I didn't think, Sorry. I'm on this. Sorry. Were you on the AC before? It just, it, I'm it, sorry. It just moved my life. Sorry, we got stuff going on. Do you want to take another? Oh, do you want to take another question in the meantime, or do you want me to keep going? What do you think? Oh, I think you muted Marcy. Marcy, I can't. We can't. Oh, yeah. Wait. Ruby has a question. Thank you. Ruby has a question. Would you take yourself off of mute, Marcy? April, thank you so much. Um, I do have a question. I uh, relinquished a biracial daughter in 1971 in Wisconsin. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we were in relation, we were in reunion for 25 years. And um, in 2016, she met her birth father's family after I, 
I admittedly harangued them until somebody came through and um, we got together with his sister. He then passed away unexpectedly in 2017. And since then, she has just become very angry with me. Um, I can't say or do anything right. And we are currently estranged. Um, and it, and it is, she's just, it's a, all about um, me making the decision I made and her being transracially adopted in a large white family in a very white community in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And uh, anyway, I, I have stopped trying to communicate because it's so hurtful, the narrative that I get back. And I'm wondering, I feel really, I know, I just feel like I'm, you know, like putting her through this feeling of rejection again by not being available to her um, anger. And I just wonder what you might have to say about that. I know it's kind of a huge topic, but. Yeah. Well, um, Really sorry, Ruby, that that's what's happening. Um, all I can say is that life brings us so many things. And I, I think loss is so um, profound, right? And I, I would venture to guess that the loss of her father of origin may have unearthed some more emotion that may need some time to work through. I, I, would, I would not give up. I would keep doing whatever work you're doing. Um, however, you're working through that grief and loss in that morning, I would continue to do that. Even if you think it's, you know, you're in a good place, keep, keep doing it because I think that's healthy and um, I wouldn't give up. And I would, I would here, I, I guess there's two things I would say. Um, continue to be in communication with her, but don't send anything like write her, write her, write her notes, like write her something that you would want to say, but don't send it. Right. And, and keep that and hold that. Like, oh, I saw something today. It reminded me of you. Um, write her, write her something like, keep that, keep that precious in a place. So it's like, let it out. And then, you know, I, I think like all relationships ebb and flow. You just never know when a life changing moment's going to happen for her. Maybe something shifts in her life where she might be open again. Um, and, and, and over time, like let it have some air, but reach out, but, but reach out and say, you know, you don't have to send anything back to me. I'm, I'm here. If you have some things you'd like to say, if you want me to hold anger with you, I'll do that. Um, but I would just want you to know that I love you. That's it. And then just keep doing the longer narrative and keep it over here. You may have a po point in time where you can share that with her and say, I know we weren't in touch for all these years, but this is what I have for you. And you know what? You may even be able to share it with her children. Let's just say you don't ever come back, but this could be something her children. I mean, it, this is a, there's a long tail on our human existence. And um, you just don't know when you might have an opening again. So don't give up. Um, I, I wouldn't give up. Okay? Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Alina, could you take yourself off mute and ask your question? Unless you would like for me to read it. I can go ahead and read it. She says, hi, I'm 26 years old and will be adopted as an adult to my permanent family. How would you recommend navigate my identity in this? What questions should I be asking myself around changing my last name? Mm, that's a great question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Elena. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Oh, how cool. Thanks for sharing that. It's exciting. Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah, it's very exciting. It's great that I get to it's great that I get to choose my family. It's like so much healing is happening. Um and yeah, I'm definitely, you know, it was like, when I asked them like, hey, do you guys want to adopt me? And they were like, yeah, like we'll talk about it as a family and we'll get back to you. And then in a few days they got back to me and they were like, yeah, we just want to know, like, are you changing your last name? Like, of course, we're, of course, you know, you're accepted into our family. You know, you've been with us forever, which was just, just a good feeling to actually have that like real, um, I don't know, you just need that confirmation, right? Like, and I, it's going to be so great to have that written down and yeah I'm just curious like well now I'm an adult that's getting adopted and 
who am I now? <laughs> like now I'm actually part of this family you're going to be it you know should I change my last name what are the I'm kind of thinking of family yeah that's a that's a beautiful question and you know I I do a lot of um like thinking about names right um and in the month of April is when we talk a lot about names and identity and this year I really was like our names belong to us they're ours they do signal, you know, our attachments to people sometimes, right, through um, our families, through marriage, through the families we create, through, I mean, but our, our first names, you know, are, are given to us, but they're ours, like, to choose. Our last names are ours to choose. So I, I think some of us go into new relationships or for our, with our last names and we, we decide that we want to change them. But I think it's really about what, what you want and what you want may be what, you know, part of what you want may be with what might make the family that's adopting you feel good. It could be a both and, you know, but it shouldn't, what I hope that doesn't happen is that balance of what you want and what they want becomes unbalanced, right? Like if it's really what they want and you're not sure, um, you could say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna think about that. Um, and you can ask folks who have changed their name. Um, it's hard, you know, it's, it's a process, right? It's a process, it's, it's a lot of paperwork and I'm not saying that paperwork is any deterrent to actually getting something that you want, I'm not saying that, but it's a big decision. It's a bit, very big decision. Uh, so I say, you know, keep thinking about it. You, you know, you don't have to make any decisions until you're ready. Um, and, you know, I don't know is a perfectly acceptable answer until you do know. And then when you do know, you'll tell them and maybe you can all celebrate whatever the answer is and whatever you choose to do. Okay. Let us Thank know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I wanna know. Will do. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, April in keeping time, it's 8.07 just to let you know. Okay. Okay. Well, do you want to keep with questions? I'm happy to do that. I mean, I don't care. I mean, I got um, stuff, but this is more fun in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Natalie, you're next. Would you take yourself off of mute, please? Sure. Yeah. I was um, saying that I'm an international adoptee, so I've experienced assimilation and acculturation like most of us. <laughs> and so, or all of us, I guess, because every family has their cultures. And I was wondering what helped you uh, connect with your heritage of um, being Black and having an identity that you're connecting with and Black empowerment for you personally. Yeah, gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question, Natalie. And thank you for sharing some of your journey of assimilation, enculturation, separation. Um, I, you know, I knew early on, I think in my whole body that, um, that I, I, I never wanted to be white. Not that white was bad and I'm part white, right? My birth mother, Helen's white, but you know, I'm, I'm West African, um, Benin, you know, Togo, the, the you know, uh, West Africa, you know, there's all pieces and parts of me that dot along the, the, uh, you know, the West side of Africa, um, through DNA, I've learned. Uh, it, it just wasn't if it was when. I left, I left Rhode Island, which is super white, <laughs> when I was 17. And I slowly made my way to New York City. And I wasn't in New York long before I found Harlem. And I was in Harlem for 25, 24 or something years. Um, and I'm back and forth there now. I'm back in Rhode Island, which is a whole other thing as a grown up coming back to this place. But anyway. Um, I went looking for it. I, I knew I needed it. And, and what, and you know, when I knew I really needed it was when I found Harlem. When I first stepped foot into Harlem, I was like, whoa, 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 hold up like this, I, I need to be here. And it, it turned a lot of lights on for me. It created a, a, a family holding, a, a cultural holding. Like I, I felt like Rhode Island was home, but Harlem was home too. And, and the other, the other, the other way that I really became committed to understanding culture and generational holding of trauma 
through the black experience in this country um, was working with youth in foster care, black and brown youth in foster care, who that's where I started my adoptment program where adopted adults like me and you um, mentor to kids in foster care. And understanding, and I did that in Harlem at a place called Harlem Dowling, which was an agency for black and brown kids run largely by black and brown persons. So it was a really unique endeavor in the city of New York for a while. They, they started to really create black leadership for black and brown kids in foster care, which was kind of a unique thing. Um, but I, learning about their family structures being enfolded into family structures that were black through this program turned on a lot of lights. And then I started to learn about history. And then I started learning about my hair. Eddie Jr.'s on 108th in Madison taught me how to do my hair 20 plus years ago, taught me how to wash it, taught me how to do the things to it. Like I didn't know these things. So, it, but, and, and once the lights turned on, right, there was no turning them off. And, and I've moved, I've, I've, I was always outpacing my family through this idea of understanding culture and race. But now I've, like I'm, I'm literally running circles around them. And it like kind of sucks in a way. It's like almost, it's almost like, not that I don't wish these lights were turned on for me, but damn, I wish my family could move better, you know, with me. Like, and they, they just can't do it. Doesn't mean they don't love me. It doesn't mean I don't love them, but um, I mean, no, and not every, a lot of, a lot of my family can move that way um, and are trying, but a lot aren't. And, you know, that's just what we, it's like the both and. So thanks for asking the question and, and, and dive in, dive in. If you want to, if you're in it now and you're learning about your culture, like keep diving in and find your, you know, find, find your tribe, like literally find your tribe. And it doesn't mean you let go of the tribe that, you know, you were adopted into and entrusted into that doesn't, it's like both. And you can have freaking both. You, you deserve to have both. And you know what? You deserve to let one go too. It doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you have to hold something if you don't want to. And I know that's hard for some to hear, but like you, you can be both and if you want it to be. It's a good question. Great, thank you. Okay, Kelly Lynn is next. Kelly, would you take yourself off mute, please? Hi. Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering um, if you could speak a little bit to your relationship with your um, siblings that you grew up with, both as you were growing up and um, and now. <laughs> Woo, okay, so my April podcast is with my sister. So you know, folks haven't listened to that, you can listen to that. You'll hear about my sister. My sister's my person. Um, you know, my sister's life dramatically changed when I showed up on the scene because she was the youngest girl and kind of had it made until like the novel little brown baby girl came along and every, uh, literally all the attention went from, from her to me, literally. Like, and it was, it was awful. Like, because she was already shy, you know, and even now people would be like, oh, like you're, you're April's sister, right? Like, you know, it's so, ugh. And so that was hard, um, but we were our, like we, you know, uh, we're each other's and we love her. Like I love her, she loves me. and. So my sister's relationship has been really beautiful. Um, my brothers are interesting. My brothers are, like I said, 11 months apart. We're, we're, we're six, seven and eight years apart. Um, you know, yeah, gosh, my oldest brother is now pretty much like full on, like, Trump guy, so that doesn't work for me. Um, that's really heartbreaking because he said and done a lot of things that have um, really hurt me. Um, that's really real. Um, we don't really communicate anymore, which is really sad. Um, but I realized too that over the years, I, I definitely made it easy for them, you know, coming back and forth as I did for many years before a weekend. And I parachute in for a weekend and parachute out. And over the years, it started to get, we started to have more conversations. And the more I conversed about things, um, social justice, race related, the harder my relationships with my brothers became and are. I mean, I have another brother, my brother, Jim, who is closer to me um, physically um, uh, and relationally. Um, but, you know, it's not, you know, Cap took a knee, I was like, that's good. He was like, no, he's an ex-Marine and woo, it hit the fan, um, really hurtful stuff. And, it, and it's like, I just don't know. 
um, that 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 white people from Rhode Island, honestly, like my white people from Rhode Island, are ever going to get it, and specifically, you know, don't really have an interest in trying. My sister has an interest in trying. My mother has an interest in trying. My nieces and nephews do, but my brothers, no. So, and I have half siblings um, that I'm in reunion with on my mother of origin side, and you know, those relationships are really hard. Um, I like we try and I, they're cool, but I am so not like them. And we'll see about how those relationships grow over time, but it's hard, you know, that's like, I kind of wish it was different, but I'm also like, I got enough going on with, with the family that I'm, you know, that I'm navigating here now in real time. So, um, yeah, so thanks for the question. It's tough. It's a hard, it's siblings, sibling relationships are, are really fraught, but beautiful. Okay, April, we have a Zoom use, user who would like to ask you, um, have you ever tried to figure out your paternal family tree? Is it a way to honor our parents? Yeah, look, oh, yes. I mean, um, my paternal, my, I'm assuming that's my family of origin paternal tree, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm trying, look, there, there's been some close hits on, on, um, ancestry. A lot of folks that I've closely matched with haven't done their extended trees. Um, I, I should be sharing, I, we should be getting to that place of like figuring out who my birth dad was, but it's super intricate. And I, I feel like I'm going to have someone de dive back in, um, maybe soon to, cause this is not for me. Like, I don't know how to do this stuff. Um, uh, but I do, I definitely, when I look up the folks that are part of my tree and I see them on like social media, I'm like, oh, I look like them. Like they're, they're somewhere in there. Um, they're definitely somewhere in there. And I thought there was a guy who was my birth dad in, um, in Newport, the Rhode Island. That was interesting. That's where my, my birth mother was when I was born. Um, and he looks so much like me, but I like, I don't think he's the guy either. So we're getting there. I mean, I'm hopeful. I really hope that over time this can be revealed, you know, that would be great, but you know, life moves and, and people die, you know, and like, I worry about that almost daily that these people will leave the planet before I'm actually able to have a relationship with them. Okay, Linda Hollett, you're up next. Hi. Hi. Hi, April. So my question is, can you say more about matching foster youth with adopted adults? Yeah. And um, just a, I guess what goes on in my head with this is I'm in a community where uh, adoptees are really and I'm a first mother in reunion with my son, but with adoptees that are really against adopted persons adopting other people, they feel that it's a continuation of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious your take on that and about matching foster youth with adopted adults. Yeah, so so the program started, you know, about 18 years ago, and it started really because I was you know, in this really, really hard place with navigating my own reunion and, you know, essentially being rejected by, by Helen in June. So I really, I, I thought about, and I, you know, look, I did all the things I needed. I was working in corporate America. I had resources. I could, you know, take some time off. My family was really good to me then. I um, had mental health support. I, I, I could do all the things that were, that, were, that, were, that were, I knew what I needed and I got that support and help. Um, but I was also doing a mentoring program at the time when I worked for Kenneth Cole and it was with the, the, the state and um, a lot of the kids that were at risk in quotes, right? Cause that's a really ridiculous way to label kids, but okay. Um, also had this, this, this intersecting um, like experience with, with child welfare. So many of these at risk kids had a family structure um, challenges or, or, or separation from family or um, of origin. So I got to thinking like, wow, um, we're not, we don't have the same experience um, but we, we, we do understand loss. We do understand family structure differences. We understand not matching our family. We understand all these things um, that could be connecting points. So I started this program. Um, I'm very intentional and very careful about um, engaging adopted persons that are doing their personal work and that um, they don't have to 
agree with everything and I agree they don't have to have the same experience as me, but I'm very careful. And, and we do a, a training, we do ongoing trainings with the adopted persons um, that kind of help them understand the foster care system, help them um, understand grief, loss, abuse, neglect, help them understand de definitions, help them understand what it means to be in relationship. Um, and we're really there as, as, as a support system um, for these young persons. It's, it's, you know, um, it's, it's, it's really has to be adopted persons that are, are along their journey, but doing their personal work. That makes sense. And you're currently still doing involved with this. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Right now we're in, Har we're in, we're not in Harlem anymore, we're downtown New York city, but, um, I'm really working as a matter of fact, Latika Jeffrey, who's on this call has been, um, working closely with me on, you know, really trying to figure out how to take this program national. And, um, there's, there's just so much to be gained. I mean, some of the, 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 the more transformational moments of my life have really been through that program. I was walking down the street with one of the young women and we're walking, um, she happens to be a person of color. Uh, we're walking, walking. There's a gentleman that walks by me. Um, he's a black man. Um, she looked at me and, well, she didn't look at me because walking is the best thing or she was just walking along. And she goes, see that guy? I said, yeah. She goes, sometimes I see people like him. I think that could be my dad. And I, we stopped and we looked at each other and I said, yeah, that happens to me too. And she, we just locked eyes and she was like, for real, that happens and you, like, I was like, yeah. And you know what? I never said that out loud as a kid. I would think that all the time. I'm like, oh, Harry Belafonte is my dad. He must have been, you know, he must have, you know, him and Bewitched, Elizabeth Montgomery must have gotten together. And that's how I, that, those are my parents, you know? I mean, that must be them because that's, they could make me like, that could look like that. Um, so the fantasy, but I never uttered those words until I was a grown up. But like having a young person be able to be validated by that stuff that's swirling around in their matrix, like, you know, that's the stuff that feels like it's, the transformational stuff. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no doubt. Thanks, Linda. Okay. Um, Latika, you want to take yourself off mute? You're in the presence of greatness. Latika <laughs> Jeffries on the line. Just saying it. Just saying it. Hello. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. My question is, what is your most memorable moment with your family? I know we speak a lot about race and hair, but I know that, you know, being an adult, you have tons of memories, especially good ones. And so I just wanted to hear just a, just a little bit of that. Yeah. But I don't know some of it, but. <laughs> no, I mean, she, she knows everything already, this one. Um, but you know what? Um, my family is so like um, tight. It, like it's weird. Like we, we, it's hard to explain. But my favorite memories of my family are like the regular moments. Like all winter long, we're here. Like we're sledding. We have a big hill, and uh, and we're, we're sledding. My mom was like seventy eight. My dad who just turned eighty. We're like sledding down the hill with my parents. Right. Um, like big, like we cook, like what, like food surrounds our family. And my mom is a phenomenal cook. And I am so blessed I have my parents with me still. It's like huge. Um, but when we get together, there's so much food and there's so much abundance. It's such a blessing. And we eat and we laugh and we joke and we, we, I mean, it's like, it's just the little, it's the little thing. It's like that little stuff that's so big that feels just like, it, it, that, that, and I, and that, what gratefully that happens like every week, it happens like, you know, we're, we're also situated very close to each other. <laughs> we're going to like walk to each other's houses. Sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's not good, but um, you know, it's like, it's not just a once in a while thing or at holidays, like every, every few days we're rolling up to have a meal together. So it's that it's like, that's, that's the stuff. That's the magic. Thanks for the question. It's a, and yeah, it's love, it's magic, it's abundance, it's beauty. Well, April, we're starting to wind down on time. Yep. Uh, and I don't want you to be late for your, she's busy again tonight, guys. She's leaving us and, and going on to another one. They're a heritage family camp. So I'm going to be teaching adoptive parents who were adopted black and biracial kids. So bringing it. So we're, yeah, well, I want you to have the last comment. So that's great. Okay. Anybody, any other questions before we pop off? Okay, listen, we really appreciate you coming on tonight and having you and sharing your story. 
and learning about your journey. And um, for those of you that don't know or haven't listened to Born in June, Raised in April podcast, I think we can put the link up in the chat bar. There you go. There's the link for all of you. Make sure that you get that. Uh, tune in and follow uh, April Dinwoody online. So you. you take care. Have a wonderful weekend. Appreciate it. So I've got a couple of more things for you. Thanks, April. Awesome. Okay, take care, y'all. Thank you so much. Love you. Bye. Okay. We've got some closing slides. And... in a second. Okay. All righty. This is next Friday, guys. We are privileged to meet Alicia, Kara, and Cassandra Adams from Right to Know. So we're going to learn all about misattributed parentage experiences. So uh, this should be really, really exciting. So we'll hopefully you'll join us next Friday, same time. Right to Know. And is uh, David still on? I am Jennifer. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to remind everybody that the NAAP sponsors a bi-weekly Adopt the Past to Recovery meeting. We welcome relinquishes struggling with ad uh, addiction or any type of substance use or behavioral disorders, as well as their family and friends. It's a great place to get some social support, as well as some solution focus and accountability support. We'd love to have you all there. I, I put the link in the chat. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or anyone at the NAAP. Thank you. Thanks, David. Have a good weekend. And then Marcy, we also have uh, Dr. Joyce McGuire Pavo coming back and she is going to be, because it's a little delayed because of um, the holiday, but let me bring up a calendar and tell you when. Um, next meeting with her is, I'll get up there. Sorry, I didn't have a calendar open. Is it it's, July 13th? Yes, July 13th. Um, this always sells out. It's a once a month uh, program that we offer. So if you're interested in it, registration is available now. It's on our events page, or it's also can be found on Eventbrite. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Anything else? Ah, not unless you want to talk about conference a little bit. No, did you make a graphic for, for conference? Oh, I probably did. <laughs> But can I get to it? That's the question. Let me see. Well, while Jennifer's looking, uh, for those of you that are still on, if you would, uh, if you enjoy tonight's episode and you want to follow April, make sure to you know visit Facebook, Instagram. Um, also, uh, you can join us on Facebook to the Adoption Happy Hour, and leave your comments there. Okay, so. Again, these are our two, there are Friday and our Saturday keynote speakers. If you're going to be joining us in Indianapolis, we're really excited. And I don't have the other ones on slides yet. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, but again, we appreciate everybody being uh, with us this evening. We look forward to seeing you next Friday night. Mark your calendars and everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.